Now, it took me about 16 months to write a, an, an inventory, which is, was a long time. And, you know, things were just going to hell in a handbasket everywhere. And I knew that sooner or later I was going to stick that gun in my mouth or I was going to take a drink. And I did not want to do either one. But I knew I was going to do one or the other. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Howdy, howdy, howdy there, ladies and gents, boys and girls. That was the voice of Bubba that you heard at the beginning of this episode. And you're going to hear so much more from Bubba in just a moment. But first things First, this episode, this particular episode right now is brought to you by Terry and Todd and Kurt. You know what Terry and Todd and Kurt did? Well, let me fill you in. They went to our website, SoberSpeak.com. They clicked on the little yellow donate tab and they made a contribution Thank you so much, Terry and Todd and Kurt, for your generosity. This episode is coming right out to Ewan's. I, John M., will be the chairperson for this meeting between meetings, and I am truly honored and privileged to serve all of you listening in. So take a seat, if you will, around this virtual table and let's get started. So I ran a qua- a, a quas, across a quote uh, during some mort- morning meditation this week, and it was from page 89 of the big book, and I wanted to read it from for you guys. Page 89 says, carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. Life will take on new meaning to watch other people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow around you, to have a host of friends, this is an experience you must not miss. Frequent contact with newcomers and and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. I'll go ahead and read just that last line again. I'd like to read the whole thing, but I'll just read the last line. Frequent contact with newcomers and and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. Page 89 from the big book. And uh, for whatever reason, that really hit me this week. And just so you know, I I got that meditation from, uh, it's a daily meditation email I receive. I know some of you are on it. Just in case you're looking for a daily uh, meditation email, uh, I got it from something called Transitions Daily. And if you want to subscribe, it's, it's a free 
email service. Uh, it's uh, go to daily AA emails.com and you can sign up there. And while I'm at it, and that transitions daily site is managed by a friend of mine named Buddy C. And Buddy also has a sober meditations app. I've been using it every night now for at least a month, for at least a month. Uh, Buddy's voice is usually the last thing I hear before I go to sleep. And, and this, uh, this uh, app is another free resource. It's called the Sober Meditations app. Um, and this is strictly service work for Buddy. Uh, if you sign up for it, there's no gotcha. Like you listen to three and now you pay us $8 a month or whatever. There's no gotcha. Uh, I've been, I had been using, uh, an, in a, uh, excuse me, uh, um, an app called insight timer. And I'm sure several of you, I'm sure a lot of you know about that app out there. I'd been using it for several years, but, it, but the, the challenge with insight timer for me, at least I always had a hard time finding 12 step based meditations, but he's a member of AA, uh, and he addresses every one of the steps in his meditations and several other topics like, letting go, God's will, cravings, and, and all kinds of subjects, okay? So if you want to download the app, go to the Play Store in Google or the App Store on your ID. What is it called? Isn't that called the App Store when you're on a an iDevice? Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, for, for anything that is uh, Mac related or whatever you call that, right? Anyway, you type in the word sober meditations and you should see an icon with a like a beach and sand and sky image uh, and if you have any issues with that feel free to reach out to me i'm more than happy to help you because i believe this app can really help people once again i'm at john j-o-h-n at soberspeak.com if you uh, are having any sort of issues with that now on to mr bubba Recorded live at the Tri-Cities Speaker Meeting here in North Texas. Um, did anyone just notice how I transitioned from talking about Buddy to Bubba? <laughs> you could tell we're in the South, and I love it. Anywho, let's talk about Bubba. Uh, Bubba has been sober since March 3rd of 1988. He grew up in the oil fields of West Texas. I, I, I don't, I don't think that's actually the fields, uh, but you know, they, there's a lot of fields around them. So they call it the oil fields of West Texas. You get the idea. Anyway, he has a Baptist background and uh, he talks about that and, and the necessity of maintaining a spiritual condition and being an elder statesman as opposed to a bleeding deacon. He talks about his family in recovery and much more. And we will have plenty of oh, listener feedback at the end of Bubba's talk, which we recorded live via Zoom, just so you know, okay? Anyway, enjoy, and I'll see you on the back end with listener feedback. I'm not going to tell you where my mind went with that. Anyway, enjoy. My name's Bubba Rao. I'm alcoholic. I'm sober uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous by God's grace. And uh, since the uh, third day of March, 1988, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that. I'm glad to be here. Steve, thank you for asking me to come. Uh, this is my first time on Zoom to talk. I've got uh, a couple friends here, Joanne and Harry. That's uh, my wife's sponsor, so I'm going to have to do my best to tell the truth. And uh, Judy and Bud, these are guys that I sat in meetings with and I sobered up with. And I'm so glad that they're here. All you guys, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this uh, Zoom thing, uh, it's not a really close uh, second to a real meeting, but it's a whole lot better than nothing, isn't it? Uh, I, and I love to sit in a meeting and listen to other people talk. This is my least favorite thing to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, but I'm going to do it cause it's my turn. Uh, I, uh, 
I was born uh, uh, out in West Texas in a little town called Crane, a little oil field town. Uh, my dad worked uh, out in the oil field back in uh, 1952, and uh, we got moved up to Leveland in 55. A uh, great little town west of Lubbock. Uh, you know, I was always told that uh, it's a great little town to sit up on your front porch and watch your dog run away from home. It's it's flat out that way. And, uh, and uh, you know, salt of the earth people out there, good, hardworking people, good uh, principled people. And some of those people tried to raise me, and uh, and they gave me, you know, I found out much later that they gave me some good morals and values. I uh, just didn't want much to do with them when I was younger. Uh, my mom and dad did the very best they could with what they had to work with. Uh, I was an unruly, uh, defiant child, and, and uh, you know, I guess we all paid a price for that uh, later on. Uh, I, uh, I really uh, didn't play very well with other kids, uh, uh, didn't pay attention very good in class. And uh, so I wasn't able to do uh, what they expected me to do, which was my schoolwork. Uh, and, you know, it was really hard on my, my mother because my mother was a teacher. And, uh, you know, about seven minutes after I did something in someone's class, she knew about it, you know. And a lot of times when I got a little older, she, she had to sit in the teacher's lounge and, and listen to what I had done or said to one of the other teachers. And, uh, you know, uh, it was an embarrassment and, uh, you know, a source of shame for her occasionally because, I, you know, like I said, I, I had no control as a kid. I was just uh, out of control, absolutely, and uh, no boundaries, no respect. Uh, and, and I grew up into an adult that way. Uh, I started drinking, uh, I guess. I started sipping beers when I was about eight years old. My dad drank. Uh, he was a heavy drinker. Uh, my grandmother drank. My aunts and uncles drank. So it wasn't a big deal at our house. Uh, you know, I'd go get my dad a beer and pop the top on it and, and get the suds off of it. And, and I thought it was God awful until I got enough of it to understand why they were drinking it. And uh, from that day forward, it, had, it has changed my life. Uh, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. And then I started spending a lot of time and giving a lot of attention to drinking. Uh, alcohol uh, uh, lowered my inhibitions, and there wasn't very many things I wouldn't do. I mean, there wasn't very many things I wouldn't do anyway. But, you know, you give me a drink, and I'm – I'm off the uh, off the ceiling, off the walls, and uh, and I really loved it. Uh, and I, you know, I found some friends like me that loved it too. Uh, I went to school with a couple of guys that, you know, I found out later their their uh, father was in Alcoholics Anonymous too, and I didn't know it at the time, but uh, uh, really good friends that I grew up with, and uh, and we spent a lot of time uh, saving our lunch money, you know, saving our 35 cents. That's how old I am for lunch. And, uh, and buying booze, uh, you know, on Thursday night, we, uh, we played football. Thursday night was our game night. And like good athletes, we'd go to the bootlegger and pick up some booze after the game and ride around and act like big boys, you know. And, uh, you know, I was trying to act like a big boy uh, – for a long, long time. And then when I got to be a big boy, I'm trying to act like a young kid. So it's been a long road. My, my old sponsor used to tell me that about all I can tell you about my childhood is it was really, really long. Uh, uh, I met my wife and, you know, I got to tell you this. I met my wife in the sixth grade on the band bus in this old town that we were from. Uh, the band bus picked up all the students at all the elementary schools and took them to the high school so we could have a band session uh, for six period. And uh, she had just moved to town and, uh, you know, I heard how pretty she was and, and she was, she was gorgeous. And so I got up on the bus and I got in the seat behind her and, uh, and just, you know, was just amazed. She was just really a beautiful girl. And, and, you know, I just wanted to 
welcome her to town. So I just reached up and gave her a little kiss on the cheek and, and scared the hell out of her. You know? And, uh, you know, the crazy thing about it is we've, uh, we've kind of been pretty much, uh, hooked up since then. Uh, you know, she spent a couple of years trying to get away cause she thought I was stalking her and, uh, maybe I was, I was young and ambitious and she was really gorgeous. And, uh, she's right in the bedroom right now watching the uh, national park series. And, uh, and thank God that, uh, on the day that, uh, I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, she gave me one more chance, you know, uh, uh, and I'm so, so grateful for that. I, uh, I can uh, tell you a story about, uh, you know, a, a guy that uh, uh, everywhere I went, I was drinking as much as I could, spending all of my earned money on booze. And, uh, and then later on, when my wife worked at the bank, I was spending her check on booze. So uh, on Monday morning, the bank would get the checks that I'd written from the bar. And sometimes she never even got a check because I wrote up her whole check and, and, uh, at the bar. And, uh, and bless her heart, she hung in there for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, about uh, 1980, we were having some problems, uh, marital problems, as, you know, alcoholic families do. And, uh, you know, we're having financial problems, legal problems and relationship problems and children problems. Our children were getting older. Uh, we'd been married about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years. And, uh, and it was coming off the rails. Uh, I had, we had, uh, we didn't know whether to get a divorce or go to Jamaica and we had tickets to Jamaica. So we went to Jamaica and, uh, found some folks just like just like me and hung out down there for about a week and, uh, got back to, to, uh, to work and, uh, and decided I needed to move to Austin from Leveland, this little town. So, uh, I packed up everything. Uh, after I got a, a job, I had gone to school with a guy that his father owned the store down there and, uh, he put me to work and, uh, and I moved to Austin and, uh, you know, I told you I had a problem uh, paying attention. And when I got to Austin, it just got worse and worse and worse. And, you know, the thing I really loved about Austin was it was open all night. For days, it was open. Uh, I got in a tremendous amount of trouble down there. I couldn't pay my bills because I'm still drinking like I was earlier. And only it was getting worse. Uh, I'm hanging out with some guys that are have an import export business and, and it's a problem. It's a, it's a large problem. Uh, it got crazy around our house and we, we, we knew that it was time to take our children to the airport, put them on a plane, get them out of there. And we sent them back to West Texas to Teresa's mom and dad. And, and we loaded the truck late one evening and we drove them out of there cause it was time to go. Uh, about, uh, Two months before that, I, I got a letter from the phone company saying that uh, the Lubbock County District Attorney had subpoenaed my phone record for the past year. And, and I knew what that was about. Uh, there was a couple of guys that we were acquainted with that uh, were stealing trailers in, uh, down in Austin and taking them to West Texas and selling them or vice versa. They were stealing them in West Texas and taking them to Austin. And, uh, this one day they, you know, they'd been up for a while. And this one day, this highway patrolman stopped him to see if their trailer was stolen. And he called him in. He went back up and sat in his car, got this guy's driver's license and put it in the clipboard and called in. And, uh, about the same time, the guy that was driving the car got his pistol out from under the seat and walked up there and shot the highway patrolman in the head and killed him. And that's what started all of this in motion. Uh, actually, what started it in motion was by drinking years before, but and now it was a uh, it was dire. It was uh, imperative that uh, I get out, and uh, so I went back up to uh, to West Texas, 
and uh, one of the guys that I'd gone to school with, father owned the store, and he put me to work. You know, these uh, these guys didn't have any idea what they were getting into with me. Uh, and they took really good care of me, and, and they paid me way more money than I was worth. And I just I couldn't produce any work, and they just kept me on. And uh, great people, uh, you know, some of the, the these guys treated me like their family, and uh, and I'll always remember that. I'm, and I'm still close to their son; he's my age today, and all of his family. Uh, got back out there, uh, went to work, just got sicker and sicker and sicker, and. Uh, this went on for seven more years, and uh, and and one day my wife got a call from uh, uh, the school uh, principal, and uh, the counselor had uh, called him and said, "Hey, uh, there's some problem. Uh, there's a problem over at their house, and I don't know what it is, but uh, their children are uh, suicidal." and and you need to call her and tell her to get them out of the house today. And so he did, you know, this was a guy that I had in the fifth grade that was our, uh, our teacher in the fifth grade. And he was a principal at the, my children's school now. And he knew me all of my life. And he called Teresa and told her, you know, listen, you got to get your children out of the house. Uh, they're, they're suicidal. And my wife, we hear a lot around Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, had a moment of clarity and she went home and she packed their clothes and she went by school and picked them up. And, uh, and I don't know how it happened, but for some reason I knew I was in trouble. So I went by the school to try to see if I could talk to her. She wouldn't even roll the window down. She uh, picked up the kids and left town and ended up about 70 miles from Loveland at her folks house. And, uh, and that's what started us on our journey. And, uh, and I'm always, uh, always want to be grateful for her having the courage to pick those kids up and leave me that day. She left me that day. And, uh, and you know, what I know now is it saved my life. Getting, getting away from me saved their life. And it also saved my life later on. Uh, you know, I had to sit in that house uh, all that day and and I had to do what I know now was take some inventory. And I wasn't coming out good on that. I, I couldn't make it look any different than it really was. I had abused them for years and years and they just couldn't take it anymore. Thank God they couldn't take it anymore. And someone called uh, the principal. and. Uh, and so Teresa's in Seminole, and uh, and I'm in the house all day. Uh, and I, you know, the things that I'd been doing, I'd been thinking about sticking a pistol in my mouth for years because I couldn't make sense of of why I was doing what I was doing. They certainly didn't deserve what I was doing to them, and uh, and I was going to try to put that gun in my mouth and and stop all the insanity, and. Uh, I finally got up enough nerve to go talk to a friend of mine, and uh, and I told him, uh, you know, I went out to the liquor store that was owned by the county judge, and I knew him real well, and I wrote a hot check out there, and I bought some liquor and a six pack of Bud Tall Boys. I'm gonna try to drink enough, quick enough to put that gun in my mouth and stop it, and uh, and you know, uh, you'd have had a different speaker tonight. Uh, thank God I uh, I was too weak and cowardly to do that. And I ended up at my folks' house, and I had to go in the house, and I had to tell them the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my whole life. I had to go in the house and tell them something was wrong with me. And it was not a surprise to them. They knew something was wrong with me. I told them, Teresa and the kids left me. And they said, well, we certainly understand that. Uh, you've been abusing them for years and years. You're hard on people that are closest to you. And so uh, my uh, my sister is a uh, uh, trauma supervisor, or she was. She'd retired the last couple of years over at a Cook Children's Hospital. And and uh, they called her because they didn't know what to do with me. And, that, you know, frankly, didn't want anything to do with me. 
and I don't blame them, not at all. And uh, they called my sister, and my sister said, uh, listen, keep him there, and let me uh, see if I can call some people at St. Mary's Hospital in Lubbock. And that's what she did. She called some people she knew, some nurses there, and uh, they got me uh, an assessment over there, and he told them, asked my folks if they'd drive me to Lubbock. And, you know, it's 11 o'clock at night, and they took me to Lubbock took me down in the basement. She told me there'd be a guy there waiting to talk to me. I went into the hospital, went downstairs and, and I talked to this guy and, and he sat me down and he said, uh, do you drink? And I'm drunk as a skunk when I'm talking to him. I said, yeah, I drink every chance I get. He said, do you take drugs? I said, every chance I get. And, uh, he said, well, you might be an alcoholic. And I, and I, I didn't know what that meant. Not at all. Um, and he said, uh, and I said, well, what can I do about it? He says, uh, you can, uh, it might be that you can live a, a reasonably happy and a sober life in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, what do I need to do? And he said, well, it might require that you come into the hospital for 28 day drug and alcohol treatment. And uh, I immediately told him how busy and how important I was. And he pointed to the door and he said, there's the door. Why don't you come back when your life's a little better? And, uh, you know, I found out later this guy's sober for eight years. He'd been sober for eight years. That's the first time someone in Alcoholics Anonymous told me the truth. He said, hit the door and come back when it gets a little better. And uh, he gave me a shot, uh, Benadryl, and sent me home. and knocked me out. They put me to bed. My mom and dad put me to bed trying to figure out what they were going to do with me. I got up the next morning and I started drinking. You know, my dad had retired early and he was having a couple of brews about 1030. And so I joined him. I drank three or four beers and, and I'm sick. I'm sick as I've ever been in my life. And I know it now. Uh, I'm heart sick. You know, uh, the woman that I loved more than anything in the whole world packed her kids up and left me. And, and I knew that I was out of chances. And uh, I, I asked my dad if he'd take me back over to the hospital. And he said, son, you need to go somewhere because you're not staying here. And he took me over to the hospital and, uh, and he took all my paperwork into the hospital when I had insurance. And he got me checked into drug and alcohol treatment, came out to the emergency room. I sat in the car and drank while he did that came out the emergency room door and he had all those papers in his hands and he waved them at me and he said, come on in. And I finished my beer and I locked that truck and I walked in there and I hadn't had a drink since that day because of God's grace and Alcoholics Anonymous. Those people in that treatment center uh, introduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've been told many, many times, and I believe it, that the reason they use Alcoholics Anonymous in treatment centers is because it works. It works. And uh, I went in there and, uh, and I paid attention and, and it was a life and, and death errand for me. Uh, I took notes. Uh, I was in there for 35 days. I got out. I went back to Level Land. And it wouldn't be too long before I ran into Bud and Judy sitting in the South Plains group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and, I, and I did my best to uh, do what my sponsor, Robert, asked me to do. And, uh, and I, it was painfully slow. I know for him more than it was for me because I'm sitting around all the time talking about how I want my wife and kids back. I need to get my wife and kids back. And, and Robert and Ruby, his wife, his little Al-Anon black belt wife, used to tell me, you're not sober long enough, you're not honest enough, and it's too early for them to come home. And that's the last thing I wanted to hear. You know, but I'm just, you know, I'm still pulling the scam, trying to get what I want. And, uh, you know, after about five months, uh, I went to aftercare every Thursday for five years. And after about five months, uh, Teresa decided that she would come back home. My son had been living with me and, uh, he was, uh, six or seven, I, I guess. And he had come back to Leveland and stayed with me 
because he was having a hard time up there and and, uh, and I was just tickled to have him and anyway uh Teresa finally uh, she'd come and visit on the weekends and she finally moved back to to level in and moved back in and, and you know uh I, I finally called uh, Robert and Ruby and, uh, you know, after they moved in and, and I, and I, I let them know that Ruby, it's too early. They came back too early. <laughs> uh, she thought that was funny. And, and now I had to deal with it, you know, and, and that's how I started uh, trying to take the steps in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I, you know, it took me a long time to understand that, that I was powerless over alcohol. I, I didn't really understand what that meant. I knew that every time I drank, I couldn't stop, or most times I couldn't stop unless somebody made me. And uh, I understood that. But, you know, it'd be, it would be a few years before I understood the depth of my powerlessness. And, uh, and that was because somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous shared their experience with me. And it was my experience also. I was uh, in uh, San Antonio, and uh, Howard P. was down there. And he came into uh, a restaurant where we were waiting to eat lunch with him. And, and, uh, and this is a long time after I got sober. But, I mean, this had left an, an imprint on me, and it still has an imprint on me, of Howard sharing uh, his morning meditation with me. He was talking about the doctor's opinion, how it talks about in there uh, uh, that uh, people drink essentially because they like the effects produced by alcohol. And while they admit it's injurious, uh, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the truth from the false. And he said, what does that mean to you, Bubba? And I told him, I said, well, I, it, I don't think I know what's real, Howard. And he said, how about this? you start drinking for effect, right? And I said, yes, sir. And I keep drinking for effect. He said, but after a while, you still think you're drinking for effect and you're drinking to overcome a powerful craving you'll never, ever be able to overcome. And he hit me like a ton of bricks. I never registered that before. And I'm, I always be grateful for that. Uh, I like uh, what Steve uh, says about uh, the doctor's opinion about the the allergy. His theory about the allergy interests us. Uh, it explains many things for which I cannot otherwise account. Man, does it? How I could keep doing those things over and over and over for days and days. You know, against my will. But I kept doing them anyway. Uh, you know, uh, uh, coming to believe that, uh, that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I didn't have a problem with the sanity part, but I had a little problem with uh, a power greater than myself. I'd always been spiritually curious, but I thought it was like some kind of mystical thing. Uh, and this uh, the introduction to uh, the spirituality of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous to me w seemed uh, inadequate. Absolutely. I was just reading that in the book earlier that it, it did seem inadequate, but I, I didn't get the grasp of it. And uh, I, I like in the We Agnostics where he tells us three or four times the way Bill writes, uh, he repeats himself so everyone will have a chance to understand what he's saying. And he says, do not be concerted. Choose your own conception of God. Th that was foreign to me because, uh, you know, that little Baptist church I was raised in, we didn't have our conception. We had their conception and, and we would accept it. That's what I heard. I don't know if that's what they said, but that's certainly what I heard. And and I didn't get it, you know. Uh, and and it was important for me to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand Him. And God, as I understood Him, was the good people in Alcoholics Anonymous, good orderly direction group of drunks. I could understand that. 
And I could see these people, I could see their lives changing. And, uh, you know, it didn't seem like my life was changing that much, but I could see these guys changing. There was a couple of people in Alcoholics Anonymous when I got there, and I used to work, a friend of mine owned a bar. How about that? And I, I worked for him so I could drink cheap. It wasn't free, but it was cheap. And uh, there was two customers that we had in there, Rayoma and Danny. And I knew these guys. And in my estimation, they were terrible, terrible drunks. And I'd serve them whiskey with their head on the bar asking for one more drink. And I looked down on them. And when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous in, in that little bitty town in Leveland, Texas, there they were, both of them, sober and Alcoholics Anonymous sticking their hand out to me and uh they've been helping me ever since and uh and and there's the proof that i need i need to see uh, i need to see i need visual proof you know and there were danny and uh and rayoma and they were both sober and, and i'm so grateful for that and uh, a lot of those old timers in that meeting you know i'd grown up with their children robert uh you know i knew both of his children and uh and all I ever heard about Robert was that he was out running again. And Robert agreed to sponsor me. And uh, I went to Robert one time. He had uh, we'd done a little business transaction, and I hadn't paid him on time, it, you know, the way I do. And uh, he wanted to know when I was going to pay him. I said, well, you know, Robert, I had the money a couple of times, but, and I don't know why I didn't pay. And he jumped up out of his chair and slammed his hand on his desk and looked me in the eye and because I told him I didn't want to lose all those things that he said he lost. And he, he slammed his hand on that desk and he looked at me and he said, I didn't want to lose them either, but it was necessary. And you know, it went right over my head necessary. Wow. And you know, I would come to believe that those things that I lost shortly after that little talk, it was necessary for me to lose them. I had a uh, had not made a payment on my house in about seven or eight months. And the guy that I was working for was on the board of directors of that bank when they took our house. And he did not want to do that, but he knew it was necessary. Uh, I had a, a an old crew cab pickup. It was about a, I don't know, four thousand dollar truck and i had about eighteen thousand dollars in it and i would not let go of it and so the bank traded me some equipment for my truck they said listen we're gonna we can get both of them but if you'll let us have the truck we'll sell it and you can keep your equipment that you know they made great deals with me and uh and so, yeah, I lost some of those things, and I learned to do without them. Somebody loaned me a car, and then somebody sold me a car on credit. And, you know, they didn't know me very well, but they did. And, uh, and I'll always be grateful for that. I, there's a little conference out, and there was, out in Leveland, and it was on Mother's Day every year. And uh, the guys that I sobered up with uh, told me to get, get involved and stay involved. And, uh, and that's what I did in that little conference. And uh, those guys, uh, they showed me how to to do things in Alcoholics Anonymous. They made me wipe tables off, uh, empty ashtrays, make food. Uh, they 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 showed me about the fellowship, and they shared their experience in Alcoholics Anonymous with me about the steps. Now, it took me about 16 months to write a, an, an inventory, which is, was a long time. Uh, and, you know, things were just going to hell in a handbasket everywhere. And, uh, and I knew that sooner or later I was going to stick that gun in my mouth or I was going to take a drink. And I did not want to do either one. But I knew I was going to do one or the other. And so... Uh, I'd been putting this off for 16 months and I, and I took two days, two days to write this inventory. And I, and I called my sponsor and he said, well, you need to call Robert P and little Phil, make an appointment with him and take your fifth step. 
And so that's what I did. I went over one Sunday afternoon and sat down with Robert and, and told him all those things that I swore to God I'd never tell anybody. You know, Robert was an old retired sailor and he had a big old split scar down his nose where somebody hit him with a shovel trying to kill him one time. And I trusted that old man for some reason. Because, uh, you know, when, when, when you get willing, God puts somebody in your life. And uh, always be grateful for Robert. He was a, a great old understanding guy. They also uh, uh, instilled in me that, listen, if you ever get any sobriety, it will be contingent on you working with other people, helping people, helping drunks. And so, uh, you know, when Robert would get someone that he couldn't work with anymore, he just sick to death of them. I didn't understand what that meant at the time, but he told me, uh, he said, here's his phone number, call him. Call him and go get him and take him to a meeting. I did that many, many, many times. I took people to treatment. I, you know, I was like a mad dog on a newcomer. Uh, it was crazy. But I did it because I, I wanted to stay sober. Uh, the I did something that uh, it talks about in our book about getting on my feet financially before spiritually. And uh, I got in a... In a trade magazine and I found a traveling job, something every drunk needs, every new drunk. And uh, I took a job in Atlanta and, and hit the road and uh, just pretty much stopped working the steps, just trying to increase my bank account, trying, you know, because I'm, I'm guilty for all the things I never gave my family and now I want to give them. But I'm not taking any direction and, and I'm out on the road and I did that for five years. <clears throat> excuse me and thank god that uh, those old timers uh, told me to get some phone numbers get hooked up in here find out all you can about alcoholics anonymous and call these guys when you get up in their part of the country and that's exactly what i did we worked in 30 different states and that's exactly what i did i, I went to meetings on the road in 28 of those 30 states and I met some great people, and they helped me immensely. And uh, they shared their experience with me. And uh, after five years, I got off the road. I moved to Dallas. That's how I got to Dallas. Uh, uh, our kids were uh, old enough to start doing the things that we'd been doing. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I got to see my children, God bless them, uh, play me and their mother, just like I played my mother and father. And, uh, and one quick story, uh, I was in uh, Lake Murray uh, four or five years ago, and I heard old Iron Mike talking about all the trouble he caused between his mother and his father. And it hit me that I, I needed to go talk to my mother about the very same thing. These things come to me uh, at, at, at different different times and they're just clear as a bell. And so I went and talked to my mother about the problems I caused her and my dad. Uh, you know, the big deal at our house when I was growing up was getting a haircut. I, I'm not getting a haircut. Don't like authority. Uh, took a trip to California one time because I didn't want to follow the rules anymore. I was 14 years old, ended up in LA with a couple of friends and Anyway, I, I knew I had to go back and talk to my mother, and I, and I mentioned that to her, that this guy had talked about the trouble between his mother and his father. And she looked at me and smiled and said, I know exactly what you're talking about, son. <laughs> and so I got to make amends for that. And, uh, you know, my, my pop died in 2006, and uh, I was telling my sponsor the other day, I wish, I, I wish I'd have been better prepared I should have been better prepared to uh, be a friend to my father than trying to be a son. Because, you know, he didn't, he didn't care about me being a, a good son or any of that. He just wanted me to be happy. And, uh, and he knew I wasn't happy. He knew I was having a lot of problems. But uh, he, uh, he uh, had cirrhosis of the liver and uh, a couple of other things. Uh, and, uh, you know, I got to go over and spend the last couple of days of his life with him. 
and I was in the room with him when he took his last breath. And, uh, you know, there was something uh, really, uh, you know, it scared me to death to be in the room with him when he was dying. But uh, I sat in his wheelchair and I woke him up about every 45 minutes because uh, there was so much acid in his system. He'd just lock him up and he'd have to have a drink of water and set up just for a minute and then he'd go back to sleep. And, and I'm so grateful I got to spend the time with him right before he passed. Uh, I wouldn't have missed that for anything. You know, I'm grateful for that. The sixth and seventh step, Jim Williams always said uh, it was only about that big in the book and it couldn't have been that important. So I skipped it. And that's kind of what I did. First time around, I, I skipped it. And, uh, you know, I still got all the character defects I had when I came in here. They're just not as glaring. And by God's grace, I hadn't had a drink. And I'm so grateful for that. Uh, it took me a, a good long time to make a proper eight-step list and uh, to make some amends. After I got back off the road to try to clean all of my wreckage of my past up. And, uh, and to promptly admit when I'm wrong. One of my buddies tells me uh, on a regular occasion that promptly, we only get one shot at promptly. And, uh, and I need to remember that. And when I'm wrong, I need to promptly admit it. It doesn't say if I'm wrong. It says when. And uh, I do my best to uh, say my prayers every morning. I uh, ask God to guide and direct my, my life for the next 24 hours. And say those prayers and ask him to discipline me in this simple way. And I try to give him all the praise. And I turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him or don't understand him. And some days I just don't want to do that. And I have a difficult day until I go back and clean that up and uh, try to do my best to surrender. Relieve me of the bondage of self. You know, uh, self is my problem. It's still my problem. You know, ask him to, uh, to have all of me, good and bad, and to take away the things that stand in the way of my usefulness to him and my fellows, to grant me strength as I go out to do his bidding. Uh, I do my very best to stay in, in touch with a lot of drunks. People call me, uh, sometimes people I hadn't heard from in, in quite a long time. And uh, it's, it's so wonderful to get a call from somebody you hadn't heard from in a good while. And uh, I, I try to do my best to call people and, uh, and let them know I'm thinking of them. And if there's anything I can do for them, especially in these times, uh, I want to I want to talk about one more thing and then I'm not going to talk about it anymore. And uh, that was uh, a couple of years ago, I, I uh, uh, was not continuing to take personal inventory. And uh, and I got into a trap that I've heard a few people talk about. and. Uh, and it's a trap I got into and didn't even know I was in it. Uh, and it was my ego and, and myself. And, uh, you know, at our group, uh, 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 a lot of the old timers had died or gone to other places or couldn't go to meetings anymore. And, and I got to thinking that I knew something dangerous for a drunk like me. And, uh, and I took my group conscience hostage. That's exactly what happened. I stepped on the toes of my fellows and they retaliated. And, uh, and it took me a while to stop doing that. I admitted it to my sponsor. I admitted my wrongs to the group. I made amends the best way I could and stopped doing that. Uh, that's an illness I don't ever want to get again. And all I have to do is continue 
to practice these principles in all my affairs and uh and let somebody else do that because i i I don't have anything that they don't have absolutely and i don't need to be acting like i do uh i i want to uh thank you very much for uh for asking me to come talk uh I hope uh, that if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, you can take something that I said and use it. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is the best thing that's ever happened to me, and it's because they introduced me to a power greater than myself and a way of living that uh, that I don't have to drink anymore. And, uh, and I'll always be grateful for that. Uh, my family is back together. My daughter came in uh, last night late. And, uh, you know, it took me 25 years, 25 years to have a relationship with my daughter. Because, it, you know, like it says in the book, I've been especially stupid and stubborn about some things. But uh, she's she's back in my life, and, and I'm so grateful for that. And She's on fire for Alcoholics Anonymous. Our son and daughter-in-law are sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, and 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 I'm so grateful for that. And and they're making their their way through Alcoholics Anonymous like like we have, and and I'm so grateful for that. And Steve, thanks again, brother, for asking me to talk. Bud and Judy, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Bubba. That was most enjoyable. If you're listening to this and we have any feedback from Mr. Bubba and you would like me to pass that on to him, I am at John, J-O-H-N, at SoberSpeak.com. And for that matter, if you have any feedback for any of the other speakers that we bring on to the podcast, feel free to reach out to me and I will get that message passed on along to them. If that particular episode or any of the episodes had some particular significant meaning to you, will you please pause your device and share that episode uh, or the entire podcast with another individual, either a friend or a family member? It may be just what they need today. Now, on to a little bit of listener day la feed back. Chris C. writes in and the title of or the subject line was Bill C. Bill C. is one of our uh, other guests that we've had on the podcast many times. And he says, one of the Q&A questions during Bill C.'s talk really struck me. And what Chris is referring to here is that we did a a Q&A session with Bill C. Live, and you, the Sober Speak listeners, um, submitted your questions to Bill C., and that's what he's talking about. One of those questions really struck him. He said, one of your listeners asked, what's the difference between knowing and, quote, conceding to your innermost self, unquote, that you are an alcoholic? And Bill C. addressed that in his, uh, uh, in, during, during that live session. He says, I am 60 days sober at this time. After 10 years sober, I relapsed for a year and have had a few relapses after going to rehab last summer. What has struck me this time is the realization that if I drink or use, this time it won't, in big capital letters, be different. Than it has been the delusion that it will must be smashed as our literature tells us. I struggled with this over the last nine months. I have tried on three separate occasions to quote party this weekend, unquote, man, I get that Chris and go reestablish on Monday. Not only, and I know this, oh, do I know this so well, Chris, not only does that never happen, but the emotional and physical collapse that precedes reestablishing is simply no longer worth it. 
This is my concession of powerlessness. And while this is an important concession, this knowledge is insufficient to maintain long-term sobriety. It must be followed by the strenuous action of the steps, if I am to live. Chris C., very well put, Mr. Chris C. That is, uh, uh, I thought, think you did a very great, a, a fantastic job of summing up step one and the concession and my innermost self there. Uh, well done. David D. writes in and he says, John, David D. here, really big fan of the pod. It is my, it is really my meeting in between meetings. It makes my daily drive that much more enjoyable. Well, thank you, David. Thanks for all you do. I would love to be added to the super secret Facebook group. My email is such and such. Thank you so much. And you know, I say this every once in a while, but I just want to go ahead and, uh, uh, give credit where credit is due. Uh, Mr. Dave, who is a listener of the program, came up with this uh, this super secret Facebook group thing. And I, I really love that he did that. And Dave, if you're listening, thank you again. Uh, but nonetheless, we got David D out the invite and uh, got him in that super secret Facebook group. Nuno writes in and Nuno says, hi, I am Nuno N from Gridley, California, and I'm going through my darkest moment, and I'm three days sober and clean since I found your podcast. It helps me get through my days, and I appreciate what you're doing, and I would love to be added to your secret Facebook page. Well, as you know, we got you that invite out, uh, Nuno. And God bless you and uh, all of us, well, all of us who are alcoholics and in recovery right now uh, and who have over three days of sobriety, remember what it's like to be three days sober and going through the darkest moments of your life. I get it. My prayers are with you. Um, thank you for having the vulnerability to write in. And uh, I'm so glad that you're, that you are allowing me to be part of your journey. Mark, 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 Mark. Oh, I'm sorry. Where did that come from? Anyway, Mark posted on Podbean regarding Ryan L. And this is episode number 77. It's called NFL opioids and turning a new leaf. And Mark posted, he said, thank you. He's talking to Ryan for your unselfish use of your time. Lighthouse comparison or likening was very insightful. Uh, uh, Ryan during that episode compared, it, he made a lighthouse comparison and he says, God bless you, John and Ryan. I subscribe to your podcast and I visit your website. Very expiring experience for me. I see good things ahead of me, Mark. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, and I see thing, good things ahead for you as well. If you continue to do the work, uh, and by the way, he said very expiring experience. I'm wondering if that's a typo or that is just a way to, exp uh, to describe an, an experience. So I have to think about that a little bit. Karma writes in from New Zealand. It's another Kiwi. She says, hi, John. Um, could you, could you serious? She says, thanks for replying. Could you seriously not understand my drunken bumble of words? Are you not a mind reader? So <laughs> I have to tell you, she submitted a, a question kind of, sort of, through the website and had her email on there. And I just had to, I, I sent back a message saying, I'm sorry, I don't understand your request. Uh, you know, I wasn't really a drunken writer when I was um, uh, out there, but I was definitely a drunk dialer, like in the middle of the night. Oh, there's no telling who may get phone calls. And sometimes I remember them. Sometimes I didn't, but I would love to get on that phone. And the, and the phone calls were either something like, I love you so much. You're the best or I hate you. So, you know, it's kind of a combination of both. But anyway, so apparently karma got on our website. 
uh, over there in New Zealand uh, in the middle of the night and and submitted a question, actually a couple of times questions, which made no sense. So I had to reach back, reach back out to her and said, okay, karma, uh, what are you asking me exactly? Not sure I understand it. So, so that's where she said, could you seriously not understand my drunken bumble of words? Are you not a mind reader? <laughs> Smiley face. Anyway, she says, I sincerely thank you for your podcast. I've listened to about 14 of them and they are a great comfort to me. I live in a little town in New Zealand. I'm not going to say the name of the town. I'm 39 years old, a mother of two and married. I have been recently redefining my definition of alcoholism. I am an alcoholic. I have never said no. I've, I have never said that to anyone ever. Well, to me, that may be a, a journey toward the first step there, Miss Karma. But nonetheless, she says, I've never said that to anyone ever. Well, now you have, and you have said that to many people. <laughs> she says, my husband works long hours, day shifts, and night shifts, so I am able to hide my drinking from him quite well. I only drink a few days a week, but I have been behaving alcoholically for a few years now, i.e. I'll buy two bottles of wine, but he'll only know about one so that it appears that I'm drinking less. I generally wait until the kids, five and eight years old, are in bed before I get drunk alone. Things could be a lot worse for me in my situation, and I feel like I am on a slippery slope. I would agree, Karma. She says, uh, the days that I'm not drinking, I would like to, and I think about it every day. I am going to get caught soon. And then she says, cue the music for impending doom, smiley face. My mother is a recording, is a recovering alcoholic. We've not had a great relationship and she is volatile. I don't feel like I can tell her as I don't want to light the fuse. My grandfather was also an alcoholic, so he, so it is in the genes. My dad is, quote, normal, unquote, and very supportive, but I would break his heart, but it would break his heart if he knew. I really appreciated Dr. Eric's interview, and she's talking about an interview that I did with, uh, the episode was called, uh, um, Doctor, alcoholic, candy addict. All right? So it's it's one out of probably around episode twenty or so. It's you know back in the beginning. She said I appreciated Doctor Eric's interview and the information he passed on about dopamine, and I was wondering if you could please point me in the direction of some scientific literature that delves into the genetics and effects on the brain and body, etc. So, so I just, you know, I want to stop there. I did get her an article that Dr. Eric uh, sent over to me. Um, and I know you're on the beginning of this journey, car journey karma. But Dr. Eric and I both agreed. Uh, you could look up all the information that you want. And, uh, uh, and I, I'm not knocking that, uh, but I will tell you that in the book, it says self-knowledge avails us nothing. Um, and, you know, so anyway, I sent you that, that article. I do, I am hoping that you make it into a meeting someday here though. Uh, my mother has bad nerve damage that I'd like to understand better. Also, I'm helping, I'm hoping that if I understand myself better, it will help to lessen the guilt over my behavior. Uh she says, I'm under no delusion that I will be able to cure myself this way, but I feel like I need to start doing something. She says, blank, the small town that she lives in is a small town and I'm not ready to quote, come out, unquote, or go to a meeting. I definitely need to stop drinking probably forever. I have no friends that are sober and I will really miss the ones that I do have. And she switched, switches to the subject of God, God. I was raised 
Without religion and the word God makes me very uncomfortable. I feel that there is a higher power, but I have a real issue with organized religion telling me what I should believe or do. <laughs> I would say that you could get in line with most of the rest of us in Alcoholics Anonymous. Anyway, she says AA seems to use the G word quite a bit. Anyway, thank you for your time and consideration. If you could point me uh, to further podcasts or books about alcoholism and the medical slash scientific side of things, I would really appreciate it. I better send this now before I lose my nerve. Kind regards, comma. Well, you know, I I'm so glad that you sent that karma. And uh, I appreciate your vulnerability. And uh, as you know, I got you, like I said, that, that information from uh, Eric that you can read up on. And uh, I also get, uh, offered to get you in touch with another uh, woman in the program, uh, if need be, uh, for, when you need the, for when you need it and when you get there. But uh, uh, God bless you. Thank you for writing in. Thank all of you for writing in. This is another episode of Sober Speak in the Books. Love you guys. Keep coming back. It works. If you work it, we will most likely see you next week. See you on the other side.